So welcome back, or welcome to the 13th edition of the RCA Training Tip Show. Now before we get into this video and talk about why shims have a bad name, according to a few, you might have clicked on this video and thought, what the hell is a shim? Well, according to Google and Steve Hogg's website, a shim is a means to lengthen a functionally or measurably short leg while cycling. A shim stack may be needed as a short term, medium term or permanent fixture. And as you can see on my right shoe, I now have a six millimeter shim. Now before you click off this video because you think you have perfectly symmetrical legs, you may be interested to learn that I rode for 11 years thinking my legs were perfect and guess what? They're not. Additionally, Neil Stanbury, who is the expert bike fitter we'll be talking to in this video about shims, tells us that over 70% of cyclists that leave his clinic leave with a shim in their shoe. Which just might beg the question, are your legs perfectly symmetrical? Because if they're not, you'll certainly be inefficient on the bike, you'll be losing power, and there's a fair chance you'll be causing injuries if you already have not. Now, before we get into the discussion with Neil, just know that this was the question I posed to him as we begin the discussion. So Neil, after our previous video we made together where you fitted a shim to my shoe, I had quite a number of people reach out to me talking negatively about shims. So why is that? Now, before Neil responds and we get rolling in this video, just know that I've been using a shim on my right shoe for about a couple of months now. and. I've experienced one negative when it comes to the shim, which is a question I posed to Neil towards the end of the discussion. So let's get into it. Yeah, you're right, yeah. So I guess I guess the simplest explanation is if you're if you it's it's human nature to extrapolate from our own experiences. This is how we learn a lot of things. So let's say, for example, that you've got a rider who's dropping their right hip and they think they may have a shorter right leg and they whack a shim under there and it makes their right knee hurt. The tendency is, is human nature, the tendency is to extrapolate that out to shims are never a good idea. So you tar every, every situation with the same brush. And we're all kind of guilty of this at some level. It's a, it's a common psychological trait as we extrapolate from our experiences. So I'm guessing that those riders have tried a shim or been given a shim by someone and for whatever reason, it didn't work for them. So they believe that shims are always a bad idea. It's because I do this, you know, 10 times a week, um, fit, fitting shims to riders, I mean, and, and not fitting shims to riders. It's just been my experience with hundreds and thousands of people that, that shims as a tool to compensate for a structurally shorter leg or a functionally shorter leg seems to be the best option. Right. And it's, it's, not, it's not the greatest option, of course, is to make that person perfectly symmetrical in every other sense, neurologically, muscularly, and skeletally, and then you won't need a shim. But we can't break your leg and make it longer. That's probably against the rules. You know, I'm sure there's a, a law against that. Expensive so, operation too, yeah. yeah. They do it in Russia with the supermodels. <laughs> right, right. Yes, oh you can gosh. Yeah, you can have your legs broken and they put a brace really around it. You've looked into this, I've you? looked into this, yeah. So it can be done. It's very unpleasant. And yeah. you spend a lot of time on your back with pins in your leg. Wow. So we, we can't really do that. And how many people, I mean, before you continue, sorry to interrupt, but I wanted to understand, because you said last time there's quite a a strong percentage of people mm. that you examine that do have a leg length discrepancy. So roughly how yeah. how many people would it be that you see? I reckon it's about three quarters to, to 85 or 90% of people leave my my clinic with a shim. And often wow. it's really small. I'd, I'd say probably 75% to be safe. Wow. It doesn't necessarily, someone pointed this out in the comments of your video, I think I read it, and they're right. It doesn't necessarily mean that that leg is structurally in the bone yes. shorter than the other one. Because it could be a functional leg length difference, right. which or a mixture of the two, which is very often the case. If you function your whole life with a, a six millimeter shorter leg on your right side, invariably you develop some muscular asymmetries from that, which then exacerbate the the the, the leg length difference. So one of your hamstrings will be bigger and stronger than the other, and the opposite quad will be bigger and stronger. So some of this six millimeters, for example, in your shoe, you may only have a four millimeter shorter leg, but, but because you're muscularly imbalanced to a small extent, you require six millimeters to not drop your right hip down and forward. And if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. There's mm. no point in me going, oh, Cam, I believe that your leg is only four millimeters shorter, so I'm just going to put a four mil shim and leave you dropping your right hip 
and your left knee will still hurt or, or whatever is happening to the person. So we have to take that person at face value when we see them. Mm. And and especially if you whack a decent shim in like this, you want to see that person a couple of months later. And sometimes the shim height goes back down because they're much more symmetrical in a muscular sense than they were. Ah, so you drop two mils out of the shim, you, oh, you, you know, your quads have evened up, your hamstrings are My getting... My quads are uneven by about three weren't. or four mil, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a classic, you know, classic um, adaptation. So... If that evens itself out in the next few months, this may this may long term end up at a four millimeter height or five or something. There's also a chance it'll get bigger, which happens occasionally. Wow, <laughs> so, okay. but on the day that we see the rider, they're looking for a result. They they they're looking for symmetry, which stops their knee hurting or whatever it is. And if it takes a six millimeter shim, well, you know, I can't definitively say that your leg is six mil shorter than the other. But on the day that I saw you, it was. It was mm. acting six millimetres shorter than the other. Yes. So shims tend to be the best solution to leg length discrepancies. Some people um, <clears throat> will ag- advocate staggering the cleat forward. Yes. And this does work very occasionally. Maybe, oh, gee, maybe one in 50 or one in 100 people with a structural difference. It'll be the best way around the problem because for whatever reason, they don't cope with the shim for, for, for other reasons. Um, but it's extraordinarily rare that that's a, a better way to deal with the leg length difference. As you shuffle the cleat forward, it does effectively make that leg longer, right? Mm. It, it it creates a longer longer distance between the pedal center and the and the um, and the pelvis up higher up the chain, which is great. It lengthens your leg, lengthens your shorter leg. The problem with it is that it creates. A, an asymmetrical amount of foot over the pedal, right? So left and right foot have suddenly got a different cleat position, right? And anyone who's ever tried, you know, putting one cleat five millimeters in front of the other, most of the time it feels a bit off. And that's because you're challenging your central nervous system to try and maintain symmetry, but you're by adding extra asymmetry to the position. Right. So it's kind of an- antithetical to, to what we're trying to do. The rider, where as you as you shuffle the cleat forward, the rider's foot will be less stable over the pedal. So they've got a, a larger lever arm to try and stabilise the foot over the pedal. So if you took this to its extreme and you shoved the tip of the the, the, the centre of the cleat right up under the nose of the shoe, right, mm. that foot would be very unstable over the pedal as it's trying to apply force on the downstroke. So that rider is either just going to totally lose control of the stroke and just massively drop their heel through the stroke or they're going to excessively over-engage their calf as an effort to stabilise the foot over the pedal, right? Mm. But the important thing is that they will do that differently to the other side because it's staggered, right? Of course. Yeah, so, and that introduces further asymmetry into a system which we don't want to be asymmetrical. So you end up essentially with a stagger in the cleat position, which affects the amount of ankling of the rider, which then has further effects up the kinetic chain, which in my experience have been a worse solution than shimming the leg. Okay. Yes. And if another solution is not doing anything at all. Yes. And and would it be fair to say, based off your experiences then, that at least 50% of the cycling population would have some type of leg length discrepancy? If you're seeing 75% of people away Mm. If you're sending 75% of people away with a shim, yep. then wouldn't that be maybe an assumption we could make that a lot of people at least have a leg length dis- discrepancy that are yeah. currently leaving it? So where does that lead? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I guess the real question is, do I see a perfect cross-section of humanity in my clinic? <laughs> and the answer is probably not, right? Yeah. So the people that compensate fabulously for their leg length discrepancy on the bike and have no symptoms, no pain, no nothing from their leg length difference, they don't come and see me for a bike fit. Right. The ones who come and see me, the ones who got symptoms, whether it's a sensation of asymmetry or a pain somewhere, right? Mm. So perhaps I'm seeing the people who don't compensate well. Right. It's an interesting, you know, so, so maybe more people have, you know, maybe everyone's got a leg length difference and some of them just compensate better. Yes. Or maybe it is actually only 20 or 10% of the cycling population have got a, a measurable leg length difference. And those are the ones with problems who present to me. Yes, Do you know okay. what I mean? I understand, yes. Yeah, so that, that is a, a difficult extrapolation to make with any degree of, of confidence. Right, but that it's makes a, sense. It's a good question. Yeah. I've often wondered, yeah. you know, Steve Hogg always said to me, you know, we, we see a skewed sample of humanity. We see the, the weird people with leg length differences and pelvic torsions, and people with structural problems and physical problems um, because they're the ones who need a bike fit the most. Yeah, Very good point. So, yeah, it's a, it's a tough call, mate. Yeah. Very tough call. Because what are the common issues they would face? So, so if somebody's you know, watching this at home and they are experiencing 
some issues and they think it could be to do with leg length, mm. what type of issues do they cause both on the bike, but probably more so, you know, does it cause injury and what type of injuries? Oh, do it yeah, cause? yeah, yeah. It's, it, if, if it's allowed to go unchecked, it'll cause injury. Most, most cycling injuries are overuse injuries, unless you crash, right? That tends yeah. to be a fairly rapid injury when you crash. But over, chronic overuse injuries, so it can be almost anything. It, a leg length difference as part of a bad, as part of a position, will cause asymmetry in your motion, which will f- tend to favor your dominant leg, which in most of us is our right leg. So a huge number of us, when there's a positional challenge or a shorter leg or a seat being too high or anything like that, will drop our right hip down and forward. And that will typically create issues with the plane of motion of the left leg. So I guess most people who, who have a leg length difference who, who are having issues on the bike from it, they will typically end up with a left-sided knee, hip, foot, whatever. And it can be anything. It can be a hot spot, on, which only ever occurs on one of your feet, not on the other. It can be cramps in your calf, which only ever occur on one calf and not on the other. It can be upper hamstring pain, you know, lateral hip pain, lateral knee pain, medial knee pain. It can be almost anything. It just depends on how else that person is built and how well they compensate around their positional challenge, which in this case is, is a leg length difference that we're talking about. So, yeah, you, you can't say, oh, leg length differences always cause lateral knee pain because they don't, you know, yes. they, they can cause any type of asymmetrical compensatory related pain. Yes. Yeah, it, can be, it can be anything. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, I... I've seen people with, um, oh, you know, one of my feet goes numb. Only one. Is it bigger than the other? No, it's not. It's not. The shoe is symmetrical. Why is one going? It's because they're dropping one hip and loading that foot twice as much as the other. And it's not It's not lifting off at the top of the stroke because that hip is further forward. So the, the circulation can't get through the bottom of the foot and that sort of stuff. So leg length differences can cause all manner of weird and wonderful one-sided problems. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, I'll throw one slight negative at you when it comes to the shim from personal Mm. experiences. And I say slight, I'm being nitpicky here because what the shim has enabled me to do is I'm sitting on the bike a lot better. I can already feel it, I can sense it. Yep. However, when I'm getting out of the saddle, Mm. which is probably about 3% of my riding, Mm. punching it up a hill, stretching the legs, I do find it a little bit um, unnatural, the feeling. I feel like I'm getting used to it, but I'm not... 100% 100% used to it yet. So is yeah. that a common objection that you can get? Yeah, yeah, most people most people don't notice it too much and they sort of relegate it into the back of their mind and don't worry about it. It's a fairly small thing unless the shim is really big where yes. it can become a proper issue. But you're exactly right. It's, it's, it's one of the negatives of, of having a shim. What happens is, in your case, you ride with a moderately toe down attitude when, you, when you're seated, right? Yes. So because of this, the height of this shim, which is only in your case six millimeters, it's basically creating a much, well, a six millimeter taller stack height of the cleat is what people would, would call it, right? Let's say, for example, the, sh- the shim was 10 centimeters tall. It was huge, really, really big, right? That would create a lot of instability over the axle of, of, of the foot, right? Which is different to the other foot, which means that you end up with, as Steve Hogg coined this term, and I really like it, called rocking torque. It creates different rocking torque depending upon where the foot is rocking over the pedal so when you're seated and you're pedaling along your foot's moderately toe down in your case the cleat position is actually further forward over the axle by a small amount however when you stand up and you go like this it's further forward by a large amount right Mm. so the the more toe down you are as you as you're springing out of the saddle going up that climb and you point the foot right down your foot goes way out in front of the axle Mm. by 10 centimetres if it's a 10 centimetre high shim. But in your case, it's six millimetres. Now, yes. humans are pretty sensitive that you can sense six millimetres. You know, I, I've, I've tested it on myself. I can sense two millimetres of, of this because it creates this, this asymmetrical rocking torque of the two feet, which your brain can, can sense. So it is a slight negative. The flip side of the coin is it's never going to cause you a problem. You're never going to get injured doing a you know a 20 second punchy climb up a hill out of the saddle. It's never going to cause a massive issue. All it does is create a sensation of less foot over the pedal, so it feels for the, in that instant like your cleat is further further back on the shoe. Mm. And 
you know, that's that's the downside of wearing a shim. Mm. And luckily, you don't spend a lot of time out of the saddle, as, as most of us don't. We spend most of our time seated. And this is a very small negative effect of having a shim. Yes. And it's far outweighed Absolutely. by the positives. Yeah, I agree with that, yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. And this same effect sort of occurs if you stagger the cleat. Like, go back to what we were saying before. If the cleat is staggered as a, as a way of dealing with the leg length difference, you'll get the same effect anyway. Right. So you might as well use a shim. Absolutely.